Hello, everybody. Thanks again for joining us uh, here at the Jerusalem Fund. Uh, and as I always, always mention, if you could please uh, silence your cell phones so we can avoid that awkward uh, interruption. Uh, my name is Muhammad Muhammad. I'm the uh, executive director here at the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center. Uh, and on behalf of our board of directors and staff, it's always a pleasure to have you here. Uh, and it's always a pleasure to have everybody online. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's also a great honor uh, to introduce and welcome back uh, our distinguished speaker today, uh, Dr. James uh, Zurbi, uh, who will be speaking about um, political Zionism and the roots of uh, Palestinian dispossession. Uh, as uh, most of you know, this year marks the uh, 70th anniversary of the Nakba. Uh, which resulted in hundreds of thousands of Palestinians being forced to become stateless refugees, uh, including my own uh, grandparents. Uh, and they became, they became refugees in exile, waiting to return to their homes, uh, while many others were, uh, were reduced to aliens in their own country, uh, living under Israeli military rule. Uh, although the Nakba produced a nightmare for the Palestinian people, it has largely been ignored in the West. Uh, Palestinians have been victims, uh, but, but in the U.S. they have been invisible victims. Uh, when Palestinians are considered at all, they are referred to as the Palestinian problem, uh, confronting Israel, uh, and the problem that must somehow be resolved so that Israelis can have peace. Uh, in this talk, Dr. Zurbi will review the ideology and practice of the movement of political Zionism and its patron, British imperialism, uh, that together were, were responsible for the denial of Palestinian rights um, and the, uh, the subsequent campaigns of disinformation and the repression against the Palestinian people. Uh, his updated book, uh, I believe he wrote this book many, many years ago, uh, but he has an updated version. It's called Palestinians, uh, Invisible Victims. Uh, they'll also be made available after the event uh, for f uh, free of charge. So please grab a copy on your way out. Uh, a little bit about, uh, for, who, for those of you who do not know, uh, Dr. James Zulbi co-founded the Arab American Institute in 1985 and continues to serve as its president. Uh, he's director of Zulbi Research Services, which is a firm that has conducted groundbreaking surveys across the Middle East. Uh, for the past three decades, he has served in leadership roles in the Democratic National Committee and served two terms as a President Obama uh, appointee to the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. Uh, he writes a weekly column published in 12 countries. He is featured frequently on national inter and international media as an expert on Middle East affairs. Uh, in 2010, uh, Zulbi published the highly acclaimed book, Arab Voices, uh, his 2003 e-books, looking at Iran, the rise and fall of Iran in Arab public opinion, and 20 years after Oslo, are drawn from his extensive polling across the Middle East with Zulbi Research Services. Uh, Dr. Zulbi will speak for 30 to 45 minutes, after which we will have a Q&A session. Uh, again, as always, we ask that you wait for the mic to come to you, please, before you ask a question, uh, especially so that everybody can hear online as well. Uh, and for the online audience, you can uh, tweet your questions to at Palestine Center. Uh, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. James Sulkby. Thank you. I, um, <clears throat> uh, I wanted to begin with a little bit on the history of, of this book. Um, I, first, I first wrote it in 1976. Um, I was speaking uh, at NYU um, on the problem of the issue of Zionism and human rights. And uh, I took the paper that I gave uh, to that gathering and I, um, I published it in a book. The AAUG at the time, the Association of Arab American University Graduates, published it uh, under the title Zionism and the Problem of Palestinian Human Rights. In 1980, I was invited to uh, the first of the UN Special Unit on Palestine International Seminars on the Question of Palestine uh, to the Vienna Conference, um, and I enlarged the paper and presented it there. 
And then in 1981, uh, the ADC, I was the, the, the co-founder and director there, uh, we published it in a book uh, called it Palestinians, the Invisible Victims. Uh, there were about three copies left in print. I, I owned them all. Um, and it just sat there on my shelf for years. And uh, about a half year ago, I just took it out and read it. And I said, damn, this, this is pretty good. This says some stuff that people ought to know. And I, I guess what bothered me about it uh, was the following. I, I, um, I've, oh, oh, when, I, when it first came out, I made the ADL and AJC hit list. You know, it was a, I was an anti-Semite because I said these things about Zionism and I said these things about Israel um, and how dare I accuse uh, the Jewish state of, of deliberately expelling Palestinians, or, or, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you, know, you weather those storms. Somebody asked me recently, did that alter my career? And it, it didn't. It actually just reinforced my career. That's what I was going to be. I never wanted to be a podiatrist, and that was never, you know, just that wasn't who I was. I was going to be an activist on this issue, um, and th that was the price you pay for doing it. Um, then um, I started over the last couple of years, actually. I mean, Benny Morris came out with his book. But over the last couple of years, if you follow the press in, in Israel or the, here, the Forward, or some of the stuff that Jewish Voice for Peace or other groups like that are, are talking about, a lot of this is there. You know, I mean, I remember reading right before the, um, the, the Trump visit an article on Haaretz about the, um, the, the Mughrabi Quarter, where the Wailing Wall was. Um, it was a very poignant story about how on one night in the 67 war, they just sent in guys with bulldozers and, and sledgehammers and destroyed an entire neighborhood, reduced it to rubble uh, in order to create the plaza. And I thought, God, you know, they're going there to, to pray at this plaza over the ruins of the homes of a thousand people. Uh, that was in Haaretz. Uh, there will be other stories that you will see in Haaretz about some of the things that Moshe Sharet had said uh, in, in, in his fight with um, uh, David Ben-Gurion over how the Jewish state should deal with, with the Arab population. Um, and I got mad a little bit. I said, I said those things 40 years ago and you got beaten up for it, but now it's, it's there. But an entire generation of people don't know it. So we decided to take the book and reissue it. You have an, an, an earlier version of the reissuing. It's now coming out again with Mondo Weiss, the uh, website that I just uh, love for its content. Uh, they are co-producing it with us with an introduction by Philip Weiss. And um, in a conversation I had with them, they asked me, um, you know, you said all this stuff 40 years ago. Do, do you feel like you were clairvoyant. I said, no, at all, because, I mean, where did I get a lot of this from? I got it from Edward Said. I got it from Walid Khalidi. I got it from Brahim al-Abid at the Palestine Research Center. This stuff, we knew this stuff. You just couldn't say it. In uh, uh, You could say it among ourselves. We said it at AAUG conferences, but you couldn't say it in an American audience or you got blasted for it. Um, but the time is now where you can say it, and you need to say it. Um, and so we came out with the book, um, and uh, actually in the first week on Amazon, it was the number one new read, uh, so I felt pretty good about that. So our, 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 our tweets have uh, borne some fruit. Uh, what is the book about? What does it do? Uh, what it does is it, it attempts to explain why Palestinians are invisible victims. Uh, in the introduction, um, part of the, my introduction was, was read to you. The issue that confounded me then, I was, remember in 1976 when I was speaking at uh, NYU first time on this, giving this paper, um, I was, the, had founded the Palestine Human Rights Campaign. Why did we do it? What was it about? It was about trying to put a face on Palestinian victims. They were not known. And look, ju just think about it. We had a situation in Gaza, a massacre, 63 people, not a single face 
Not a single name. Not a single human story. If one Israeli soldier had been killed, we'd know the name, we'd see the face, we'd hear the family, the evening news. I remember in, in um, uh, a situation in 1981 where you might remember the bombing of the Fakhani neighborhood in Beirut. There had been a clash across the border um, in Lebanon between the PLO and, and Israelis. Um, and that first night, uh, uh, one Israeli had died and two were wounded. CBS News turned it on that night and you had ambulances and you know, flashing lights and, and, uh, and the cameramen there you know, catching all of this drama and uh, they interviewed the, um, the, the people in this uh, Israeli settlement uh, about the trauma of this, these people killed in this clash. Um, in retaliation, uh, they, they called it, the Israelis bombed the Fakhani neighborhood in Beirut, uh, which is where the PLO offices were. Um, and I think it was 283 people were killed in an apartment building that was devastated. And um, I turned on CBS News the next night, and uh, the announcer was there um, in Israel <laughs> saying, oh, we bombed, uh, Israeli bombed uh, the whatever. The third day, the story came from Lebanon, and it was the guy stationed in Lebanon standing in front of an empty street that, of bombed out buildings, saying, behind me are the buildings that Israel bombed uh, and killed uh, the, this many people. When I challenged them about it, the, the guy, the newsman from Beirut, came back with the explanation that they had gotten there that night but he said it was too dusty and it was too crowded and too congested um, and you couldn't get a picture of what was going on so we decided to wait the next day so we should show the devastation. The point in other words was that for CBS News back then the Israeli who died was worth the story of the ambulances and the turmoil and the people to be interviewed about how shocked and traumatic the event was. But in Lebanon, the story was the empty buildings that got destroyed. The people didn't matter. When Baruch Goldstein massacred people in the mosque in Hebron, the Washington Post had two front page stories on why did the good doctor go bad. One was on the front page, number one, the other was the front page of the style section. Not a single story about the Palestinian victims their names were never known, their stories were never told, their families were never interviewed. They didn't count. Not a new problem, it's an old problem. The question was, why did it happen? How did it occur? How did this people end up not being human at all? So that they became, as I like to say it, the Israeli people versus the Palestine problem. And you gotta solve the problem so the people can have peace. That's all that mattered. Even look at the Trump plan today, what you see of the shell of it, the outline of it. It's all, it's like they're, they're, they're chess pieces on a board to be moved around so Israel will be secure. It's not Israeli people versus Palestinian people, it's Israeli people versus the problem. How do we solve the problem? That, I argue in the book, goes back to the very foundation of this dilemma. From the very beginning of this, uh, <coughs> When the British and French plans became known, um, Woodrow Wilson intervened, and he made his famous proclamation. There were a lot of problems with Woodrow Wilson, but he did make his proclamation about self-determination, and he said to the British and French, I don't agree. You cannot just do this. You can't carve this all up among yourselves. Um, uh, he said, it, it really should depend on what the people want. And so, uh, being a pollster in the Middle East myself, I, uh, I appreciate the fact that he commissioned the first poll of Arab public opinion, and it was the King Crane Commission. He sent over um, two, uh, one American professor and one American businessman, uh, who interviewed a couple thousand different groups and people uh, to come up with a comprehensive view of what the Arabs wanted. Um, in the post-war period, what they, would, what they would accept. 
Well, we know the results, that they overwhelmingly rejected the mandate. Uh, they didn't want anything to do with the British and French. Back then, they didn't want the Americans involved. They wouldn't today. Um, and they overwhelmingly rejected the notion that there should be a separate Jewish state uh, on their territory. What I found interesting was that when, when told uh, of this enterprise, polling the opinion, um, the declaration uh, author, uh, Lord Balfour, said, in Palestine, he said, we do not propose to even go through the form of consulting its inhabitants as to their wishes. Zionism is of far greater importance than the desire and prejudices of the 700,000 Arabs who inhabit that ancient land. Uh, another British um, uh, Brit, um, Brit at the time said, it's a false view of democratic principles that holds because a race or nation happens to occupy a certain territory, that that territory is its for all time, nor has any race the absolute right to determine its own future at the expense of some other race which may have more to give to the world. This was the foundation of this experience, this enterprise. Max Nordau, one of Herzl's colleagues said, described the Jewish people as a people more industrious and more able than even the average European, not to speak of the inert African. Um, the, the British saw Palestine as an important colonial outpost. Um, and the way that they did it, the British and French had different ways of colonizing. The, um, what the British did was they sent companies to govern in their stead. So you had the India Company, you had African companies. The company that was going to do it for the Brits, they thought, was, was the Zionist movement. It was a perfect fit. It was like a marriage made in heaven. We need somebody to govern for us because it was the northern end of the Suez Canal. It was the eastern uh, end of the Mediterranean. They needed somebody to operate in their stead. Um, it was what Lebanon was going to be. The French way of doing it was to pit one group of people against another and cultivate one as the, so they, they, they cultivated the Maronites as their group that would provide the entrepot. Beirut was going to be the entry to the, their part of the Arab East. Palestine was to be the British entry point, and it was to be uh, the Jewish people. This was Lord Shaftesbury. Syria and Palestine will be, before long become very important. The company needs... Um, capital and population. The Jews can give it both. And has not England a special interest in promoting such restoration? It would be a blow to England if either of her two rivals should get hold of Syria. Does not policy there exhort England to foster the nationality of the Jews and aid them to return to England? And then naturally belongs the role of favoring the settlement of the Jews in Palestine. It was... Um, it was a strategic partnership. It was a strategic partnership that saw the native no differently than they saw the natives in any other place they colonized, as trees to be removed from the frontier to make way for progress, to make way for a people who could give more to them and more to the world than the indigenous people of the land. Um, and so from the beginning, Palestinians were a problem or an obstacle to be removed. Um, an invisible set of victims. Um, Zionism, which grew up in Western Europe as an ideology, um, now understand that there were, it didn't have to end up this way, there were multiple threads of Zionism. There was a religious Zionism movement, there was a cultural Zionism, um, there was a Martin Buber who taught and thought that a partnership and a relationship can be developed between between peoples that would build a, a, a prosperous land for both. He would have been a one-stater these days. Um, uh, but the, the political Zionist movement, which saw the displacement of the indigenous people and their replacement by them uh, under the patronage of a colonial power, them operating as a colonial power, was what ultimately won, won the day. Um, and... 
as I just hinted at before, there were disputes even within the political Zionist movement. I mean, um, Moshe Charette, the first, uh, um, the, you know, one of the, the early leaders of the state and a, and a prime minister at one point, actually disputed Ben Gurion's whole approach when um, when the, the the point was made that um, the, the, over over a partition, uh, the concern that the uh, the, the Jewish side had was that the partition was going to, the, the UN partition was going to provide um, a bulk of land for the Jewish people and a bulk of land for the Arab people. The, the Jewish part was to include over 80% of all the Jews in Palestine, but it was still only 55% Jewish. 45% of it was Arab, and 34% of it was owned by Arabs, and only 9% was owned by Jews. And so it was not exactly their state. It was going to be, had more land ownership uh, on the Arab side, and had 45% of the population was Arab. On the other hand, the, the Arab state was overwhelmingly Arab, um, and included land only owned by, by Arabs in that part of the, the area. The plan was, what do you do with this? Uh, and that was when the plan was developed to literally make the state more Jewish and larger. Um, Ben-Gurion called it, at the end, a double miracle. We got more land and less Arabs. Um, it was, again, they were like trees on the frontier to be cleared. It, it wasn't real people. Uh, what made the Nakba possible was that um, it was not just something that was desirable, but it was to be inevitable to fulfill the plan. Moshe Charette didn't, didn't support it. And so you'll find in the writings here a dispute over, is, this isn't the way, this isn't who we are, this isn't how we should behave. Um, he went along with it, but he still, in his diaries, wrote about his disapproval of it. Um, unfortunately, today, um, those voices have largely been silenced in Israel. Um, and you have in the governing coalition people whose uh, philosophy of how to deal with Arabs um, it, it pretty much echoes some of these quotes from the, the turn of the last century, some of the same attitudes of Palestinians being uh, less than human, less desirable, um, and, uh, and needing to be uh, removed and, and dealt with from um, Abigail or Lieberman to, uh, to Bennett and, and others, the dehumanization of Palestinians is, uh, is, is quite, quite disturbing. Um, what is changing, though, is that here in the States, you have, in reaction to that, uh, a, a kind of a split it, not only in the public opinion as a whole, but in the Jewish community in particular, and some remarkable groups um, echoing, again, some of the earlier uh, alternatives to Zionism. You know, the group Breira that existed way back when? Um, it, was, it was founded as a, a group that was an alternative to Zionism. Zionism had said, argued, it, it, political Zionism said, there is no alternative but to do this. And Breira said there is an alternative, so they call themselves Breira, which means alternative. There's another way of being Jewish that doesn't mean at another people paying the price. Um, Breira was destroyed by the Jewish establishment, but other groups have now come today that are too strong to be destroyed. Groups like Jewish Voice for Peace, or um, uh, if not now, uh, are, are making real headway in terms of changing opinion among young Jews. I, I would say what's helping that is uh, the marriage between uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and Donald Trump, uh, which is really quite, quite stunning. It's, 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 it's difficult if you're Jewish and you hate Donald Trump to find Donald Trump and Benjamin Netanyahu actually agreeing on almost everything. And that creates an opening in consciousness that is changing the way people are seeing the conflict. Uh, and it's happening in the broader public as well. Uh, what I wanted to do when we came out with the book was to say, that's good that this change is occurring. But I don't want the change to occur just because 
people are angry with Benjamin Netanyahu and Donald Trump. I want them to understand that there's a history here that needs to be understood from the beginning. That an injustice was done to an entire people who need to have their faces written back into history. They need to not be invisible anymore. Doing what needs to be done is not something just because it's anti-Israel. It needs to be pro-Palestinian as well. This equation of how to deal with the conflict can't just be Israeli people and the Palestine problem so you solve the problem so the Israelis can be secure. It's got to be Israeli people and Palestinian people finding a future where both lives matter. Um, and, uh, and so I'm hoping that the book will maybe stir some debate, maybe inform some people, and maybe create a sense of, of awareness about what Palestinians have endured. Um, it tells the story not just of the pre-state period. It tells the story of what happened in the, to the Palestinians who stayed behind from 48 to 67. It tells the story of what happened during the early years of the occupation. Uh, the book actually was written uh, in 1981, but you already had a pretty horrible record of human rights violations at that point, and they've continued on and changed in scope. Uh, it, this is not the early years of the occupation we're living through anymore. It's a very different situation. But nevertheless, it's a story that needs to be told. And so I, I thank you for coming. I thank you for getting the book. You can, if you're watching online, you can buy it on Amazon. Uh, it's called Palestinians, the Invisible Victims, and I, uh, I hope you will. Thank you. <laughs> and I'll take any questions. Yes. I can't call him. He's got to walk around with the mic and do it. Uh, Jim, it's great to see you again. And uh, you have done a wonderful work for the community. But I'm still disappointed that our voice... Next question? No, sir. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's coming up. It's coming up. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's all praiseworthy. I am wondering why we are not making our voice heard in the media. Mm. Why can't we have more Arab Americans write columns, letters, whatever, even, even uh, by space in, in, in the newspapers. Yeah. What is the problem? We have to do this immediately. George, I can't speak to why m more people don't write. Um, I, um, I can speak to the media, though. Um, and that is one of the huge disappointments I think, I think we all of, us, all of us have to deal with. There was a time when we literally were shut out of the discussion. That began to change in the 80s. And I think that the, um, the war in the Gulf in 90, 91 was maybe the high point where our voices were sought uh, on a fairly regular basis. Uh, almost consuming basis, and there were multiple voices that were there. Um, and that lasted throughout the whole Oslo period uh, that followed. Uh, after 9-11, uh, again, we were widely sought, and you had multiple uh, personalities uh, from the community who were on television fairly regularly. Um, largely, the questions that we were asked were... Um, had to do with, uh, I sort of irreverently refer to it as, tell us how the little brown people are doing, you know? Um, is it really hard being Arab these days? You know, it was that kind of thing. Um, when it came time to talk about policy issues, like what was actually happening in the region, um, they went to the experts. Um, and in, in Washington and in New York, the experts are usually failed, um, political leaders from past failed administrations. Um, positions that were not open to us. Uh, and so if you were somebody who made a mess of the peace process over the last 20 years, 
you can be an expert at Brookings or at whatever, wherever you want to be, and man, the doors are open because we just need to talk to well, what's going on in the peace process, and we'll talk to the people who blew it 20 years ago. Um, or uh, a disturbing phenomenon that has developed, I think even more so, is the networks talking to themselves. Um, and it has become, uh, I, I think it, it, it's to the detriment of all of us that reporters talk to reporters. Um, whether it's Fox or whether it's MSNBC or whether it's CNN, um, whatever the issue is, it's reporters talking to reporters. Tell me what you're reporting right now and tell me what you think about what you're reporting right now. Uh, and damage is done because they're basically talking to themselves uh, reinforcing whatever bias or prejudice they already have. Uh, CNN's different because CNN has reduced it, I think, even lower down the scale, and that is we have somebody from the right and somebody from the left, and there's, they just let them hammer it out as if there is no truth, there is no reality. What there is are two equal views, and we're going to let them make fools of themselves uh, arguing with each other. Um, it's done a great disservice to the political discourse. Now, I had my own run-ins with these folks. Um, I, uh, I used to do the Tony Sh Snow show in the morning when, when that, that poor guy who passed away way too early uh, was on. We had a respectful conversation for about seven to 10 minutes in his Saturday morning show. It was great. Tony Snow died and I very rarely would get calls. Some of the calls I would get is are like this. Uh, and I, I, guess, I, I might say for in my own personal situation, I probably earned um, the right to not get called by the bookers because I was not nice. Um, they would call me and they'd say, um, we want you to come on. Fox called and said, we want you to come on today and we're talking about Afghanistan. And I'd say, I don't know anything about Afghanistan. And they say, oh, it doesn't matter. We've got somebody from the right, and we need somebody from the left. And I say, I'm sorry, I don't talk about something I don't know about. And the booker, she actually laughed. She said, nobody ever says that to us. I said, well, <laughs> you know, call it, call it the Zogby rule. I just don't want to do this. This is not, she said, but we'll get you the daily talking points. We're not talking with the daily, the daily wire stories, the, 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 the stuff off the wall. I said, this doesn't matter. I'm not reading the newspaper and coming on and talking to you about it. I, I need to know something about it. And then one time I did Bill O'Reilly, and it was, that was the last time I was on Fox because he was, it was about Arafat, and he started to talk. Actually, there's a book that somebody wrote. With this actually made it into the book. He, uh, he asked me a question, and I said, um, I started to answer, and he interrupted. And I started again, and he interrupted. And finally, I said, Bill, I tell you what, where I come from, um, you were the host, you invited me, I'm the guest. That means that you actually owe me something, uh, being polite, and if you listened, you might learn something and your people out there watching might learn something, but if we're just gonna do this all night, nobody's gonna pick up anything on this. Well, he shut up and he didn't say another word, but I never got called back again. <laughs> CNN was different, CNN does the left-right thing, and so they want me to be on with Bill Bennett to talk about Iraq, and I said, what the hell's Bill Bennett know about Iraq? I mean, if you want to talk about, you know, drug policy, fine. Or you want to talk about gambling and losing a lot of money in Las Vegas, fine. But he doesn't do um, Iraq. But you're from the right, left and he's from the right. And that's the way they wanted to play it. And a good show was when you actually beat each other enough, beat each other up enough that they actually found it entertaining. And I don't want to go home every time I do a TV show and have to take a bath. Um, and, and so what, I don't know if others reacted the same way, but, but frankly, um, I, that's what happened to me personally. But I found increasingly that the networks, like I said, have their own panels. And so you have you know, th this illustrious group of CNN people who are there to talk about whether it's impeachment or whether it's North Korea or whether it's Wall Street or whether it's whatever. It doesn't matter what the issue is. They're going to talk about it. Um, and frankly, aren't experts. They are paid uh, hacks, good word, uh, not mine, yours. No, but I mean, that's, that's, actually the, that's actually the problem. And so 
Um, we have largely become, I mean, there are some remarkable voices in our community, but look at after everything that happened in Gaza. Um, Yusuf Munayer was on, I think, one show, and uh, Nora Arakat, I think, was on the, the, the network, CBS, the, not the network, the, the online version. Um, the absence of them from the major shows was really quite, quite striking. Um, we had to work real hard. Uh, Andrea Mitchell is a friend, and so I got to do her show, and, um, um, and I think I did uh, something else. Oh, Chris Hayes, yeah, he called uh, un unsolicited. But that, that, that's really a problem across the board. And so um, uh, I, I, I don't know. What I, I do know is, though, that there are plenty of other venues that are available to us today to actually make news. Um, and I see groups like, like I said, Jewish Voice for Peace and others actually making news right now. And uh, we'll have plenty of opportunities between now and 2020 to do that. And so we just have to be more creative in how we create stories. Um, right here, you want to do it? And, uh, and then I, here? Just before, uh, we have an online question. And uh, the question is, what do you expect to be the future of Israel and the U.S. relationship as we start to see a shift in media being a little more critical of Israel? Um, I, I think that there are shifts occurring in public opinion. Like I said, it's a partisan gap that has opened and become deeper. Um, I don't necessarily see a shift in policy yet. That will require um, a political change. And the political change only occurs in the context of elections. Um, our politicians have to know that this is that there's a painful price to pay. Uh, I, I don't think we're there yet, but I think that the day is coming when, you know, when we'll see um, people responding to this issue because their pollsters or their consultants are telling them you really don't want to go down this road right now because your electorate is just not there. Uh, it's going to take a little more. But I think that that's the direction you move in. Nothing will change in the relationship because even now, uh, in the wake of everything that happened in Gaza, you have APEC working hard in Congress to get some pretty disgusting legislation out that basically uh, wants to give uh, Israel the store, um, maybe more access to U.S. weaponry than the U.S. military does. Um, and. Um, you have anti-BDS bills being dropped one this week, I think it is. Um, and so, yeah, I, 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 it's going to take, take more. Those guys who are doing this have to know and have to be made to feel when they go home that there's a political price to pay. Uh, I don't think we're there yet. Yeah. Here and then here. Uh, hi, I know there are uh, certainly no simple solutions here, but I'm wondering about are there any, um, what kind of parallels there might be with the uh, African-American situation in the United States, with the, uh, the Kurds in the Middle East, with the uh, Catholic and the Protestant Irish. Is there something that you can learn from them or, you, or they can learn from the Palestinian movement? I think that there's obviously experiences in many quarters that are um, that are there for lessons uh, uh, to be to be learned. Uh, the and there are profound differences too. Obviously, I mean the Irish experience in some ways is the same, uh, but in other ways is 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 very different. In part because you had um, you know, you had a, a, a British government and an American government that were determined uh, to come to a resolution. Um, you don't have that here. Uh, you, you also had um, a, um, a flexibility, at least on the Catholic side in Ireland. Uh, the, I think the Protestant side needed some kicking and screaming and some assurances that they would, uh, they would be protected as part of the, uh, the United Kingdom. But I also think that there, you know, the South Africa experience, I think, has some parallels, uh, too. Um, and um, 
the difference there was that you had an, uh, an African-American community here that was far more substantial and, and in its political clout and in its ability to move opinion. I mean, when, when black leadership here adopted South Africa and began together with white allies to do their strike, their, their sit downs in front of the embassy, um, we, we don't have the capacity uh, or the, I, I tried to do, organize a, a, a bit of the same thing over the embassy move and really couldn't find uh, a whole lot of interest. Uh, people want to do a vigil at the White House or a press conference here, but, um, and, I, and I think to some extent, right, I mean, when you've got a community that is such a substantial part of the Democratic Party, African Americans, uh, organizing a sit-in and drawing a line saying this issue is absolutely central to us, uh, th that's fundamentally different than a community that is still struggling for acceptance here in the States do, doing it without a whole lot of allies surrounding it. Um, what's interesting, I think, is the extent to which these communities are now moving in the direction of understanding the Palestinian issue. Um, and so it's not so much lessons learned from their experiences in other struggles as much as it is them feeling an affinity with, uh, with what Palestinians are enduring. And uh, uh, we just honored this year at Gibran an Irish Senator Frances Black. Um, we honored her for a project she runs called the Rise Foundation dealing with victims of this, what she calls the silent victims of alcohol and drug abuse, that is family members who usually are ignored in treatment. The, you treat the addict, but the, the, the kids and the wife or the husband who've been victimized by this situation usually just are ignored. Um, and so we honored her for that, but she also is chair of the Palestine Working Group in the Irish Senate and just came back from Gaza and has been, just gave an incredible, if you look on, on either my Twitter account, which is JJZ1600, or AI, um, AI USA, which is the Institute's Twitter account, you'll see a posting of Francis Black's speech uh, in the Irish Senate, um, in which she's supporting legislation um, that would, would in fact uh, call for Palestinian statehood and call for Israel to boycott products coming from the West Bank from settlements. Um, very passionate speech by an incredible leader. And I think, you know, that's having an impact on Irish Americans who see this great woman who they know as a singer. She's a very famous singer from the black family in, in Ireland. Um, same with, uh, uh, with what's happening with, with, with young people um, and young American Jews in particular who are just doing extraordinary stuff. I mean, the if not now demonstrations in front of the Trump, uh, Trump Hotel um, were, were really important. Um, and so they create, there is a, a kind of a, a new space open for, for, for debate and discourse on this that I think is, is, is quite significant. And it, that will feed on itself and I think it's gonna grow. Yeah, uh, you have the mic, who's the mic? Yes, here and then here. No, back, then back there and then you, sorry. This, uh, I, to go back to the French and, and uh, English, British imperialism and the Balfour uh, period yeah. early on. By the way, your speech was most interesting. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, at that time, uh, there was the, and I don't think you mentioned it, the presence of Germany as a rising power and uh, very aggressive. And there were two world wars that mm -hmm. uh, we fought. And we got the money from uh, the, uh, Balfour went to the uh, Zionist movement, to the Jews, and got the money for the, for the arms. And that is why uh, I, I think what I've read way, way back was the reason that the British were very grateful to the Zionists because they could get the money to buy the arms to fight the war. Now, I, I, yeah. I may be wrong, but I've read it. Uh, I, I, I actually don't know. I mean, I know that people. My father, uh, by the way, fought in both world wars. I, 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 I know that people have made the argument. Brits have made the argument that uh, that the British government wanted the support of the Jewish community internationally. I, I, it's never really put in those terms, but they wanted that support. The, the language that I have in the book and the, the stuff that I've known and have documented is the strategic value that they saw in Palestine 
um, of having a group who could uh, colonize uh, on their behalf this territory to protect it as a strategic asset. Um, and uh, uh, that was the part that I know and, uh, and have documentation to, to show um, here and then here. And I, I, understand, I understand the point, but the, the issue here is that, and I'm not going to get in an argument with you, but um, we're dealing with, uh, reality is never pretty. It's oftentimes unfortunate uh, what, what, we are, uh, what we must uh, acknowledge. Um, and there are, uh, by count, three or four generations of people uh, living in what is today Israel. Um, they're not going anywhere. And uh, it was tough for the Irish in the Republic to acknowledge uh, that They've lived with this unified Ireland. Um, it may come about. I actually think Brexit may hasten the, uh, the, the unify, unification of the island because economic interest may end up uh, uh, dominating over the national identity. I mean, putting a hard border is going to be awful tough. You go to Ireland today, you crisscross up and down, your GPS directs you through, you know, the shortest way from Donegal to Dublin is to go straight through a place that you could not have traveled um, uh, before the Good Friday Agreement. And so do they want to go back to that? I don't think so. I, I think that, you know, we're going to see an evolution of this issue as we go forward, but we're not there yet. And, um, and I think that reality dictates that we understand that there are um, about six million people who call themselves Israelis and who live in what is today Israel, and uh, how that works its way forward as we go into the future, Lord only knows. I mean, I used to debate this issue back in the 70s, and they'd say, do you believe in the right of Israel to exist for all eternity? And I'd say, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I guess that the Romans asked people that question too, you know? And, I mean, I'm an American, and I actually love the opportunities that this country has given to me, the son of an illegal immigrant, to, to do what I do today. But, but frankly, America's not going to live for all eternity, and that gets people, like, in, in a tizzy, you know, and then they can go, they could pummel you alive and, and, you know, eat your flesh over saying that. But the reality is that's, that, that, that history is history. I don't know how it works out in the end. I mean, we elected a black president, for God's sake. Some white people are never going to forgive themselves for that or forgive the country for that. And they're, they're still sort of, the, this is payback time with this, this guy. Um, and th 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 we don't know where it ends up or how it plays out. What I do know is that the struggle for justice, the struggle for human rights, the struggle for peace is what counts. And the form that it takes in the end, I don't know. Um, I don't know where we go. What I'd like to see, what, I, what would I like to see? I'd like to see the land that Martin Buber wanted, the land that your relatives wanted, which is where you know, people welcome each other and host each other and treat each other as equals and support each other when they're in need. That's what I would like to see. How do we get there? Well, first, we've got to stop killing each other. Um, and the way to stop that is to create justice, uh, an, an, at least the modicum of justice that allows people to survive. And I think there are red lines to what is justice and what is not justice. From everything I've seen of the Trump plan, it is not justice. It doesn't make sense to offer somebody, I mean, it's like inviting a vegan to your house and putting a, ro a roast beef in front of them. It's like he, you know that they're not going to accept it. So it's a cruel, cynical ploy to say, here's the offer. Um, a lot of tough work. I don't think America's ready for it. I don't think America will ever be ready for it. I think it's got to be internationalized, but we're not ready to surrender the, 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 the reins on it yet. Uh, too many people have died. Many more people are going to die. It's horrible. But the reality is we've got to acknowledge that today there are two peoples there that have got to figure out, we've got to figure out a solution 
that at least stops the shedding and begins to move us in a direction where we can accommodate and find a way forward. Do I think, look, I said one time, and I, I was speaking at a, a synagogue here, and they asked me where I, what I saw the future. And I said, I look 100 years down the road, and I think that a, a, an Arab boy from Amman is going to marry a Jewish girl from Tel Aviv, and they're going to live in the suburbs of Damascus. It may sound crazy today. Actually, given when I said it, there wasn't, Damascus was a very, but, but the, the reality is, you know, who would have thought you got a Polish plumbers in London? Now, a lot of Brits aren't ready to accept that yet, and so they want to play that game too. But we're, we're, we're moving in, a, history moves in that direction. And a lot of bounces, a lot of ups and downs, a lot of weird curves in the road. But at the end of the day, um, that's where we're moving. The question is, how do we not put up more obstacles to get there? Um, you, you, over here, and then. Then I think you, you're it. I'm it. Uh, yeah, going back to this woman's question about uh, uh, the black movement and, and yeah. how, how the Irish movement and the, this movement, um, I'm wondering, one of the things I haven't seen until very recently uh, is some kind of awareness that all of these issues are the same, that all of these groups need to work together. It's not that what will this group work, learn from that group, but what is justice? And I'm wondering if with the younger people, are they, they starting to get that? Or is it still a very, you know, uh, a very, uh, is, is it going to remain uh, a, a, I lose words. What? Compartmentalized. Compartmentalized. Uh, a set, I, I, set hate, of, I hate lingo. The word I think that's used is intersectionality. <laughs> oh um, yeah. <laughs> okay. um, I, I I I I dare say that my um, before people started talking about millennials, my brother wrote a book back in 2008 called "The Way Will Be: um, The Transformation of the American Dream," and he described that group as the first globals. That was the term he used. And he did so because, I mean, okay, I, I take detours when I talk. Um, I was at Dartmouth several years ago giving a lecture, the, the Rockefeller lecture or something they call it. I didn't get Rockefeller type money for it, but I, I, got, I, I, I gave the lecture. And somebody came up to me afterwards and said, would you come and speak to my class tomorrow? And I usually say, no, I hate that. It's like I want to go to bed and get, go home. But because I thought it was going to be on the same thing as the lecture, and that it, I had some time, I thought, what the hell, I'll do it. So I went to the class. I got to the class, and it didn't turn out to be what I thought at all, because it was a class in social organization. And the first, the, the only question that he said was, I've noticed in your resume that you have founded five different organizations. Um, can you tell us how changes in technology have changed how you organize? Well, my brain literally exploded. Because when I came to Washington, I had a Gestetna Mimeo machine, and I was, the, I was the cat's meow. I mean, it was like anybody in the movement that needed something. Where you print those stencils, you know, and then you run the thing. I was, I was, I was great. I was like a one-man movement. Uh, when I was in Temple University in graduate school, I had the Gestetna machine. You wanted it printed? Come to me. Um, and I didn't charge. My Lebanese instinct did not uh, play out in this instance. But um, we also had an addressograph machine, which if you recall what they looked like, they it printed a tin plate with the address in reverse, and then it got blue ink, and then it stamped on the envelopes that went through. You put the, like a slide, like a slide projector, you put the thing of tin plates in, and then it did one at a time. Um, I would send out a mailing to 3,000 homes. Um, with blue smudged ink address and a Gestetna Mimeo enclosure uh, and ask for money and I get back 600 responses. I do an email today to 30,000 people and I am, if I get 100, I'm doing, whoa, that was great. This was this really, a, you know, if you get 600 people to open the damn thing, you're doing really well. Um, and so I, I thought about that a lot. You know, I've thought about that since then a lot about how technology changed. Well, my brother did 
in his book was, based on polling data, he said, we have a generation of people who are growing up in this age of technology for whom the world is a very different place than it is for us. I mean, my granddaughter, my daughter works in the polling with me, and we do these polls every year or so called Impressions of America around the world. She was in eighth grade, and she thought, I'm going to do something like this. Going on Facebook, she rounded up people in 13 countries to tell her what they think of America, and she Skyped with them and found software that you could download the Skype, and she edited it into a film. And she got B-roll of like events going on in America that kids were talking about. Um, and she did a voiceover, half hour film. It's, number one, I didn't know 13 countries when I was in eighth grade. Um, if they weren't in the social studies book, which basically was, I called it Stone Age Man to Ike, it was about you know, it started in southern France and it ended with Eisenhower. Um, and the chapter on the Arabs was, the section on the Arabs was about that big. And it was about Bedouin in the desert. And then there was a parallel with the Laps in Finland. Uh, and it was a picture of a Lap guy with a reindeer. And, uh, and they were the Bedouin in the desert and the Bedouin in the tundras, you know. And the Great Wall of China, that was it. You couldn't ignore the Great Wall because it was so freaking big. And you had to get in Marco Polo, and so that was there too. Um, the rest of it was Europe and, and America, the pinnacle of civilization. The, um, she's in a different place. She has a global mindset. And um, he then spells out in the polling what else that does to their worldview, to their, their sense of themselves. I mean, he, he sort of being somewhat irreverent, as my brother can be, he said, you know, to the, the John McCain, it was the year of McCain running against Obama, to the McCain generation, being patriotic means you put on a uniform and you fight for your country. To the Obama generation, being patriotic means you pick up litter and you drive a Prius. It was saving the world. It was having a global view. <clears throat> Even when he polls, he just to throw this question in just to see what the heck he'd find. Do you most identify with the city, your family, the city, your country, or planet Earth? Globals, 30-something percent would say they most identify with planet Earth. What's that mean? I don't know yet. I think we're still figuring it out. But what I do see is this, <clears throat> what they call intersectionality, and what you're talking about is the, the, the linkages. There's almost an instinct to feel that among younger people, in part because they feel it every day. They do it every day. I mean, they go online and they, a world opens up for them that we are still struggling to understand, and they get it. In, my 13-year-old my granddaughter got it instinctively that there were all these people and places out there, and she wanted to talk to them, and how can I do it? And then she figured out the way to do it and, and did so. Um, that has an impact, and that's why you see voting patterns different with young people than with older people. That's why you see behavioral patterns different. That's why you see religious understanding different. Um, and that's going to that's gonna continue to, 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 to play out over the years to come. And so take a copy of the book. You can get it online. I'm looking at you um, at, uh, uh, at Amazon. It's called Palestinians the Invisible Victims. And I thank you very much for hosting me. Thank you today. so much.